Hi students, welcome to HSC Earth and Environmental Science and Module 7 on Climate Science. This is video number 14. And we're going to finish our little mini-series looking at recent climate variation data. This time we're going to focus on speleothems and corals. So we have to have a look at this in this final video at some of the isotope ratio information that we might get from stalagmites, stalactites and corals. So what are speleothems? Well, paleoclimatologists refer to the whole family of cave formations that include things like stalactites, stalagmites, a few of the other things that I've included on this little picture here, drapery, columns, flowstones, all of these structures that form in, in caves uh, go under the general banner of speleothems. The good thing about them, or at least the relevant thing about them, apart from the fact that they're beautiful and definitely worth having a look at if you get the opportunity, is that they are another proxy for past climate conditions. So they're another piece of evidence that we use when we're putting together our pattern of climate change over time. And the thing with speleothems is that they can produce hundreds of years, thousands of years of data through isotope research um, and reveal some very important information about um, particularly carbon and oxygen isotopes and possibly even hydrogen isotopes um, that can help to give us an idea of some changes that might have occurred in the climate, but also through the formation of the speleothems themselves. Some of the best speleothem studies have occurred uh, for those cave formations that have occurred during the Holocene, and this has allowed climate scientists to be able to do some climate reconstruction on a yearly uh, basis, yearly resolutions. The one thing that's probably important is that um, speleothems don't have uh, consistent growth rings in the way that tree rings do, for example, uh, but they still have growth patterns and, and rings that are similar to some of the study that we talked about in dendrochronology. Um, and there's just some different types of data that we can extract from them. So what do you have to do? Well, unfortunately, one of the things that you have to do is you have to destroy some of the speleothems in order to study them. We have to remove them. So paleontologists, uh, paleoclimatologists, and also um, the geologists that study speleothems are often moving into caves in order to collect speleothems uh, by cutting them from the cave walls. Now, usually these are as much as possible in pristine caves. One of the things that does happen with some of the more famous caves, say Janolan Caves or Wellington Caves, uh, which are ones that are not too far from where we are here, can often be contaminated by the people that are walking through. Just the mere fact that you have a lot of people walking through, um, assuming that none of them are actually touching any of the formations. And of course, if they do, then the oils in our skin uh, can certainly cause some damage or at least some changes in the growth patterns. If scientists are going to study these, they want uh, pristine or at least as good samples as they could possibly get. They're going to have to remove some of the speleothem in order to study it. And what tends to happen with these is that they get sliced in half and then polished, which shows the growth rings. And you can see a sample um, that's been prepared of a speleothem that's on the um, Newcastle University Earth Science um, page. And it gives a really nice indication of the growth rings as well as the little tiny holes, which are basically uh, produced by micro drills. They are used to try and collect small samples of the calcite. So we know that um, this, is, this is limestone. So limestone consists primarily of calcite as its, as its main mineral. Calcite is calcium carbonate. And as a consequence of that, we have um, carbon and oxygen as potential isotopes that can be used in the analysis of things like the delta 18O uh, values, but also seeing if we can link any of those to any of the other data that we have. And that's one of the values of proxy data is that we can line all of the different types of data up and see if they're telling us a similar sort of story. The thing with um, speleothems is their morphology, their structure, and their mineralogy. The, the construction, we said primarily calcite, but other things that may be there as well can link to climate-related phenomena. So um, the, one of the things that's very important about the formation of stalactites, the ones that are from the ceiling, dripping down to form the stalagmites, so they're the ones from the floor or the ground, 
um, that are rising up are affected very much by things like drip rates. And these drip rates are going to change. Often they're going to be related to the groundwater, the amount of groundwater that is available. And that's going to be a consequence of how much rain there has been. Also, variability in the cave ventilation temperatures can also contribute to um, evaporation rates, drip rates, and formation rates for these different types of cave formations. Now, in addition to looking at speleotherms, we also have grouped corals together here because corals basically are the living forms of what would in the future produce limestone and potentially become speleotherms. So they too are based around this calcite mineral, the calcium carbonate. So you can see uh, three important elements in there, calcium, carbon, and oxygen. We know that both carbon and oxygen have isotopes that we've used in the past for various purposes as part of our geological studies. Corals, again like trees, increase their size on a regular basis. So they too are proxies for climate evidence. And what we again want to do is we want to look at these different sort of growth patterns, these ring patterns, as we go back in time and look at these different types of cores, get a sense of how, um, what the sort of growth is like, uh, take samples to analyze the um, various ratios of isotopic uh, forms of things like oxygen and carbon to get a bit of a, to build a bit of a picture as we have in the past of um, these sorts of different levels to see whether they're consistent with the, the other knowledge or the data that we're gathering from other places. When we look at the oxygen isotopes, we get uh, senses of the rates of precipitation or evaporation. We also have talked about the fact that the, the delta 18O values link into ice volumes and temperatures of surface waters. And we also know that we can look at carbon isotope analysis as well, which is basically around productivity in the water column. So obviously there's going to be a lot of living organisms that are going to be requiring uh, a certain amount of carbon to build their tissue structures as well as the chemicals that they need for their life processes. And so we want to uh, get a bit of a sense of how uh, much productivity there is in the water column through those carbon uh, isotope analyses. One of the key things about corals, of course, is we know where they're found now. So we know that they're in uh, tropic waters. They tend to like shallow areas uh, and they, they don't like to be too cold. So that gives us a little bit of an idea of the sorts of um, climate conditions that corals prefer to grow in. And of course, by looking at the distribution and presence of ancient corals, we get an understanding of, and, and, and obviously we need to extrapolate and say, well, if there were corals in these areas, then the climate in those areas must have been sufficient in order to support the growth of those corals. So they must have been kind of um, shallow seas, uh, relatively warm, uh, in order for that to have occurred at some point in the past for those corals to have actually grown and then to have died and for their remains to be preserved. So this is our final area of proxy data, another piece of information in the puzzle. And we're trying to build this picture of recent climate variation. So again, more data that we're collecting on the most recent periods of time. I can't go back too many years here um, as we try and correlate all of the data that we're receiving from tree rings, from ice cores, from corals and speleothems, uh, from Aboriginal art, and also from the instrumentation that we've been able to build pictures over time to get a sense of how well the techniques that we're using now with things that we are, we are uh, examining now and how confident we can be as we look back in time. So this closes our little section uh, on recent climate variation and some of the ways that we've been able to tell what's been going on in the past. But part of this very important module is about looking forward as well. It's about looking at the impact that humans are having on climate and whether or not there are any things that we can actually do to mitigate that. And we're going to start looking at some of the human impacts on climate in our next video. Thanks for watching.